This week on the BRS160, we're going to unveil the sump we used as well as give you a few tips on building your own do-it-yourself sump. Hey guys, my name is Ryan. Welcome to another week of the BRS160 where every week we do our best to help you guys, members of the reefing community, enjoy your tanks and find new ways to explore the hobby. We do that by following the setup and progression of this 160 gallon reef tank. Today we're going to explore sumps. What they're for, different types available, including a DIY option, show you what we selected for this tank and install it. A sump can mean a lot of different things to different people, but it's really just a place to install equipment that wouldn't fit on or in the tank itself and helps make sure the tank looks clean and presentable in your living space. Many reefers will tell you that sump is a necessary component to a successful reef tank, which is really more of a guideline than a rule. You can absolutely have a perfectly functional tank without a sump. In fact, my first aquarium was a 90 gallon with a bunch of hang on equipment. And for a beginner, I would say it was pretty successful. Even as someone brand new to aquariums, basically anything I put in the tank thrived using only hang on equipment and a good maintenance schedule. However, from that point on, every tank I've set up has had a sump of some sort because there are different levels of what success looks like. I want to use better, larger equipment to reduce dependence on maintenance like water changes, remove hang-on stuff which is not very attractive, makes the tank look cluttered, and I just want to avoid as many cords, top-offs, and heaters in the tank as possible. There's some additional advantages sumps bring to your system like a larger system water volume that leverages that dilution factor we talked about in last week's episode and makes the system more stable. It also increases the surface area exposed to air which increases gas exchange and helps keep the water oxygen rich. There are four basic types of sumps out there starting with something relatively new which are tanks that have a small sump integrated into the back of the tank. There are a variety of retail sump options available. You can make your own custom sump using glass aquariums, and of course you can have a custom sump made to your specific needs, typically made out of acrylic. For the BRS160, we asked Rick over at Synergy Reef Systems to build us a custom sump because we had some specific needs. The sump turned out spectacular, but before we dive into that, we're going to give you a quick overview of all the options. I think the innovative marine tanks are probably the best example of the sump being incorporated into the back of the tank. Had these been available when I started my first reef tank, I would have seriously considered them because this type of design has a good portion of the benefits associated with sumps without all the complexity associated with plumbing and maintaining a sump. The compartment in the back allows you to hide a small return pump, your heaters, and auto top off, has compartments for filtration media, and can even hold a tiny protein skimmer or other filters. I think this is a great solution for newer reefers as well as people looking for a quiet, easy to maintain tank for their offices or other low maintenance environments. Most of you are aware of innovative marine smaller desktop nouveau tanks and cubes, but they have tanks up to six feet wide and aesthetically look a lot sharper than a typical tank with a bunch of hang on equipment. There are a variety of retail sumps out there. The Aquion and Octopus sumps are pretty popular. Most of them have an area for some filter socks which capture the larger floating particulate matter and foods that went down the overflow. An area that can be used as a refugium or protein skimmer and an area for the return pump. Notice there's a baffle between the last two chambers. This stabilizes the water level for the skimmer and helps remove micro bubbles from the water before it hits the return pump. The Octopus models are a bit more simplistic, which really provides a lot of flexibility for the type of equipment you might want to use in the future. Some come with a filter sock and an adjustable baffle. Also looks like Vertex is on the verge of releasing their new sump design, which you should expect to be pretty sharp as well, so keep an eye out for that. It's likely you can find a retail sump that fits your needs, but if you can't, you might want to look into one of the companies that specialize in advanced reef sump designs, or you could even build your own do-it-yourself sump designed around your particular needs and equipment. The most common do-it-yourself sumps use a 20-gallon long or 40-gallon breeder glass aquarium. Nice thing about using a glass tank is they're cheap, available at basically any pet store, and it's easy to customize them. To create the baffles and compartment dividers, you can select between glass and acrylic. Both have benefits and challenges. Best practice is glass and a reef safe aquarium silicone like this one from ASI to secure them. This is because silicone creates a really strong bond with glass. Glass does present some challenges because it's harder to cut. The edges are super sharp and decent tools and materials are a bit harder to find. 
Best advice I can give today is use safety gloves and glasses the entire time. The glass edges out of the box are super sharp. The glass may break and little bits of glass can fly out during the scoring and cutting process. Eye protection and gloves are really a necessity if you don't want a bunch of band-aids or worse at the end of this project. Cutting the glass isn't particularly difficult. Use a scoring tool to mark where you want to make the cut and snap it or use a tool to pop the two pieces apart. You can find a super cheap tool like this one at a typical big box hardware store near the glass sheets. It does work, however a new user might have a somewhat difficult time cutting a straight line. I found these two options which are much easier to use at a local arts and crafts supply store called Blix. One has a self-lubricating wheel and a handle which makes it much easier to apply pressure and cut a straight line. The other uses a guide block which makes it difficult to mess up. Even more so if you also pick up the interlocking guide bar which makes it almost impossible to mess up the scoring. After you cut the pieces, you'll need to polish the edges and remove the sharp irregularities. If you skip this step, expect to cut yourself during this project or over time as you put your hands in the sump. This can be done by running some medium grit sandpaper over the edges. I found this emery cloth works well and stands up to abuse better than typical sandpaper sheets. As to where to get the glass itself, most large hardware stores stock up to 3 16 thick glass in various sizes. In most cases, I prefer quarter inch glass, but you're probably going to have to look up a glass shop in your area, order it, and go pick it up. Honestly, if you've never cut glass before, you might want to just save yourself the hassle and have them cut and polish the edges as well. This is especially true if you don't own any of the cutting equipment already. Acrylic on the other hand is much easier to work with, less dangerous, and almost every large hardware store stocks it in quarter inch, which are significant benefits, and why so many reefers use it for projects like this. There is one significant disadvantage. Silicone does not bond very well to acrylic, so it's not as structurally sound as glass to glass bonds. Many reefers will say it's good enough, and I'll agree that it is in most cases. However, we should know what we're talking about when we say good enough. The bond is actually much weaker than most people realize. To demonstrate this, we set up two demos of three different types of silicone on glass and acrylic. You can see on the acrylic, I can break the bond with my little finger, and on the glass, it's basically impossible to get off without using a tool of some sort. We did a more accurate test here where we bonded glass to glass as well as acrylic to glass, similar to what you would do with a sump baffle. You can see while the silicone that's on the glass won't come off, it's pretty easy to break the bond that it has with the acrylic. On the glass to glass bonds, it's impossible to separate the two from each other. I'm going to break the glass before I break the silicone bond to the glass. After seeing that, you may ask why many people say it's good enough. That's because you're adding the baffles to an aquarium which is already watertight and the small leaks between compartments that develop over time are likely not a huge deal in most cases. More or less the silicone here can really just be relied upon to hold the acrylic baffles in place. For that reason it's a good idea to use a generous amount of silicone. Cutting acrylic is super easy. Just score it a few times with a tool like this one and snap it off. Give the edges a quick sand and you have a usable baffle you can silicone into place. Regardless if you use glass or acrylic, put a healthy bead of silicone on both sides of every seam that comes in contact with glass and then wipe away the excess with your finger. You do need to make absolutely sure not to damage the silicone on the tank itself when you install either type of baffle. I suggest cutting a bit off the corners if you're going to go all the way to the bottom so you completely avoid touching the tank's original silicone seals. I'm going to be open and honest here, do-it-yourself sumps like this are a great project, an extension of the hobby. If you're a handy, detail-oriented person that owns some of the tools already, this can save a good deal of money as well. However, if you've never done anything like this, a measure once type of reefer and don't own any of the tools, be prepared to mess up a few pieces, measurements, and material where you get a handle on it. The cost of materials and tools in this case are likely going to exceed the savings over the retail sump options, but it will be a fun project. Project. The last and coolest sump option is using a company that specializes in advanced reef sump designs. They probably already have what you're looking for in a stock design because they live and breathe reefing. You can also have companies like this do a custom design, but be aware custom designs will probably cost twice as much or more than stock designs because of the time and expense related to developing new plans, revisions, and programming the CNC machines that cut the plastic for a one-time use. This is also going to take a lot longer to receive your sump, so expect to be at the end of a fairly long waiting list in most cases. However, going custom means it can be designed around the equipment and filtration you plan on using in your particular system. 
We needed something big so we can fit a lot of equipment in the sump as well as give a space so you guys can get a good view on the installation and really see what we're doing. That's why we went custom. I find myself going to Rick at Synergy Reef Systems anytime I need a sump. He does focus on his stock work, which is all spectacular and will fit most people's needs. But if I beg him long enough, he'll find some time to build something custom for me. Rick produces smoke sump and overflow for the 70 gallon in my office, as well as the auto top off box for the clown harem tank in our lobby. The sump he created for us here is top notch work. From left to right, I'll call it a few of the cooler features Rick implemented. There are two bulkheads for our overflow overflow plumbing which feeds into the four filter sock array. Filter socks are one of those things that many people love or hate. I personally find as long as I maintain them they're a good solution for reducing the floating particulates in the water column as well as some nutrient reduction by capturing food that goes down the overflow and gives us an opportunity to remove it before it breaks down into nitrate and phosphate. There's also a nice port down there which allows us to clean this area out as part of good maintenance or rescue crabs, snails, or even an unfortunate fish that might make its way down there. If we'd ever want to bypass the filter socks in the future, this port would allow us to do that as well. There's a polycarbonate lid on most of the compartments to reduce noise and any salt spray. Polycarbonate doesn't warp like typical acrylic lids and a nice upgrade. He also included a refugium chamber we'll use to grow macroalgae. All the flow holes are laser cut and clean, which means they're less likely to attract algae growth like milled holes that leave rough edges. Well, a refugium isn't typically going to remove all of your nitrate and phosphate. Anything that naturally reduces these nutrients and the need for water changes is a good idea in my book. The side benefit of being a safe haven for microfauna like copepods and amphipods to reproduce and populate the tank is a welcome advantage as well. You can see the main chamber is huge. We can fit basically any skimmer or filter in this area and we have room to grow as the industry comes out with new technology. There's also a bulkhead for the emergency line and our bean animal style overflow. Emitting here means it will make noise as it splashes to the bottom and let us know that there's a problem with our main overflows. You could also use this to bypass some of the return water around the refugium if you wanted lower flow in that chamber. Down in the corner there are some nice probe holders as well as an adjustable baffle so I can manage the water height for various skimmers. Up top here Rick installed some quick connect dosing ports because he knows I'm a big fan of two part. These could also be used for an auto top off as well as a whole variety of trace elements or additives. You can see the tubes empty into a high flow area between the baffles of the sump. There's some protective covers on the base plates which will keep the larger snails, chunks of macroalgae and other random items that somehow made its way down here from entering your return pump. The thumb screw knobs will make it easy to remove these if needed so you can clean out this area. The last chamber is for your return pump. You can see there's a lid here with some nice cutouts for the power cords. There's also a bulkhead. It's pretty common to connect your return pump to some silicone tubing, which is then connected to hard plumbing to reduce vibration transfer and noise. This is going to make that super easy to do. There's also, of course, a laser etch Synergy Reef Systems logo. Overall, this is just a sweet sump with an excellent attention to detail and going to serve our needs really well as we explore reefing and setting this tank up with all of you. We're going to do the actual plumbing of the tank in week five. So today's setup is going to be pretty simple. All we need to do is place it on an ultra flat surface. So any of the irregularities of the surface of the table or acrylic don't create pressure points. Some people use flat sheets of pink insulation foam from a hardware store, but closed cell black PVC foam is a lot more attractive. Search for a local plastic deal in your area and they should be able to provide the closed cell PVC if that's what you'd prefer. On a larger sump, I think it's wise to take it one more step further and throw a piece of eighth inch neoprene on top of the PVC, which is going to provide an ultra safe surface for your sump to rest on. A couple of last tips related to sumps. Everyone asks which brands of silicone are reef safe, and the answer to that is the ones that clearly state in the packaging that it's reef safe for aquariums like DAP and ASI silicones. Outside of that, we're just guessing, trying to save 10 bucks based on that guess, which is really kind of silly in my opinion when you consider the cost of building the tank and stocking it. It's also important to keep in mind that it is possible for anything to leak on a long enough timeline, and some piece of equipment could go crazy and splash water around, so it's a really good idea to throw a couple of moisture detectors around the sump, which will set off an audible alarm if they ever detect a leak, which means you can catch them before there's any damage to your stand, floor, or home. 
Next week, we're gonna talk about a very important topic related to aquariums, which is redundancy. Redundancy is the most essential component of owning a long-term successful reef tank. So before we get into installing the equipment, we're going to do a redundancy deep dive. So start jamming on that subscribe button. You don't wanna miss it or any of the future BRS 160 episodes. If you're interested in checking out more information on Synergy Reef Systems or all the custom acrylic work they do, or the innovative marine tanks we talked about, hit this link where we can compiled all this information on our website. Rick's work is super cool and it's absolutely worth checking out. See you next week with week four of the BRS 160 Redundancy.